On the night of March 13, 1997, the residents of Phoenix, Arizona were stunned by unidentified lights that appeared above their city. In what appeared like a triangle flying across the night sky, the event is known worldwide as the Phoenix Lights Incident. But what you may not know is there is much more to the story that most rarely hear about. You'll see that it's wavy because I was shaking. Tonight, we are doing something a little bit different to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the event. In more of a presentation format rather than my standard interviews, Dr. Lin Kitai, an eyewitness to the Phoenix Lights, is about to step into the vault to offer a breakdown of the entire saga. Not only did she witness the main event that you likely have heard about, she was also witness to numerous other UFOs in the same area, even months before what she calls the mass sighting, and they all lack explanation. Stay tuned, you're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking this journey inside the Black Vault with me. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., owner and creator of theblackvault.com, and I'm pretty excited about today's show because we are talking to somebody I've, that not only I've known for a very, very long time, we met many, many years ago, sadly have lost touch over uh, the last quite a few years uh, with all sorts of world events and pandemics and all sorts of stuff, but I am so thrilled to have the Dr. Lynn Kitai joining me here. Uh, Dr. Kitai, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day and, and joining us to talk about the Phoenix Lights. Uh, this is a supreme pleasure, not only to speak with your audience and to, to set this, the record straight. There is so much mis and disinformation out there, and we haven't talked for a long time. A lot has evolved since we last spoke years ago, and um, I'm honored to be part of your show and to, to share the data. The data speaks for itself. Um, I never had any interest or knowledge in the topic at all before my husband and I had a very close sighting to our home two years before the mass sighting. And I happened to capture 35 millimeter photographs uh, of incredible, what they call now UAP, uh, anomalous aerial phenomena. But the ironic part is that besides having no interest or knowledge in the topic, before uh, this all happened, my life's work has been community education of health issues. Uh, not only did I start in medical school doing that for the community, but uh, I was a, a reporter on NBC in Philadelphia with Jessica Savage, anybody that knows that name, she was kind of my mentor out there. And a syndication grew from that of 120, 60 to 90 second pieces that was actually showing when we moved to Phoenix in 1980 at CBS, and then I started doing health tips uh, on set as well for NBC here in the early 80s. And by the mid 80s, uh, in the practice, adolescent medicine is my specialty, I was seeing uh, teens uh, drowning in substance abuse and wanted to get something out there to wake them up to the reality and got together uh, kids that had been there, experts in the field, and then I brought in my other hat. Before I went to medical school, I was in professional musical theater on Broadway and touring companies. I toured with Gordon McRae in Oklahoma and Betty Grable and Guys and Dolls and understudied Barbara Eden in Sound of Music and uh, actually uh, also played Alice in Alice in Wonderland with Sherman Hemsley the, from the Jeffersons and uh, also was in Raising Arizona, Cohen Brothers 20th Century Fox hit movie um, about a family uh, who has quintuplets and Nicolas Cage and Holly Hunter uh, who can't conceive actually decide to kidnap one of the quintuplets 
Harris, and I played the mother of the quintuplets, Florence, Arizona, Raising Arizona. And um, what's ironic is that that movie opened in 1987, 10 years before the mass sighting. And I stayed anonymous for seven years after thousands of people saw what I had been saying. We're going to really get into it on March 13th, 1997. And once I came forward in 2004, I started touring the world, uh, as you have done. And um, someone came up to me in 2006 or seven and said, you know, there's a um, reference to your character, Florence, Arizona, and UFOs in Raising Arizona. And I had no, I didn't even remember because I hadn't watched it since the late 80s. And on going back after one of the quintuplets is kidnapped by Nicolas Cage and Holly Hunter, there's a press conference and in front of our home and a reporter sticks a microphone in my husband's face and says, there's a rumor your son was abducted by UFOs. Is there any truth to that? And my husband says, oh, please, son, please don't print that. If his mama reads that, she'll lose all hope, which is totally different and opposite from my own take, which we're going to get into. Um, but it's the only reference in the entire film about UFOs. And to make it even more poignant, the cinematographer who was just getting started went on to do big with with uh, Tom Hanks, when Harry Met Sally with Billy Crystal, um, How the West Was Won with Will Smith and a host of others, also created and directed the Men in Black series, which opened in 1997, the same year wow. as the Phoenix Lights. That's just, just a little little tip of the iceberg of the coincidences, so many serendipities we'll, which we'll get into. But the other serendipity is that after dedicating my life's work to vital health issues for the community. When this fell in my lap, literally and figuratively, right outside our bedroom window in 1995, um, I felt obliged as a scientist to collect the data as scientifically as I could. And then of course, to share it as well as a physician to let people know they're not alone, even though most anomalies can be explained, only a small percentage cannot, just because we don't have the technology yet to definitively define what these things are, it doesn't mean they're not real. We might just be looking on an AM dial for an FM frequency. So it's time we get this topic out in the open and address it, accept it and study it so we can find out not only who's driving these things, but also move forward in our own evolution. But for me, I knew nothing about this topic. And here it was the night before my birthday, not a little coincidence. Uh, I just celebrated my birthday, February 7th, and it was the eve of my birthday. And we live pretty high on the mountain in Paradise Valley. If anybody's near a computer and they want to click on to the Phoenix Lights Network website, which is filled with really intriguing information to explore and consider, and go to the photo page, Phoenix Lights Network, www.thephoenixlights.net. And you'll see the topography. We're really high on the mountain. And one wall of our bedroom is a window. So whatever pops up out there, we have a panoramic view of the city skyline, which we really enjoy. And um, planes, helicopters, streetlights, car lights. And we face the um, south. So we see the airport. We see everything coming in and out from there. So we're very familiar with the lights out there. I was taking a leisurely bath. My husband, who is also a healthy skeptic, when you're a physician, you must be open to whatever walks through the door. But nonetheless, I got to see it to believe it, right? And he's standing at the window. My mother-in-law, my dear mother-in-law, had called to wish me a happy birthday from Philadelphia. Where we were both raised and born, born and raised. And he's on the phone with her. And suddenly, and he was on several hospital and state medical boards and nothing ever ruffled his feathers and he sounded alarmed he said lynn get over here quick what the hell is that and i grab a tail ringing wet run to the window and a little below us and again we're nestled in a mountain range it gated community there is no way this was military and a little below us over a very treacherous desert landscape with three amber orbs in a pyramid formation one on top and too closely aligned underneath. And it was just, whoa, what is that? And, you know, most people will tell you when they see something unusual, they don't want to move <laughs> because you don't know how long it's going to last. And my first instinct, because I had uh, created the um, uh, video and workbook curriculum, was to run downstairs and get my camera, but I didn't want to miss anything. So I took everything in mentally, the size, the shape, the color. They were about 
three to six feet each, depending on how close they were. They were absolutely oval shape. I always said they were like an egg on its side, but they were oval shape, which is interesting because now that the Nimitz pilots have come forward to talk about their Tic Tac sightings and that they're oval, like a lozenge and whatever, it's like, whoa, well, I don't know if it's the same thing, but nonetheless, they were oval. And I call them an orb because the light did not extend outside the edge. It was self-contained, uh, a uniform amber light throughout. And I noticed immediately every light out there glared except these. It was very soothing, very mesmerizing. And um, I thought, if I don't get a picture of this, no one's going to believe it. So I run to the closet to grab my 35 millimeter camera that I took sunset pictures of. I collect sunsets. And um, my husband calls me back. He said, get over here quick. One of them is disappearing. And as we watched, and I always go back to this 95 sighting, two years before the mass sighting, because I saw this up close and personal just yards from our home the top orb without budget from the other two that were closely aligned underneath started to shrink very very slowly like a, a dimmer switch it's, it's difficult to express in logical terms um you know looking back they were probably cloaking but nonetheless mm -hmm. like a dimmer switch mechanically as if there was an intelligence behind them and it got smaller and smaller very slowly until it was pea size and then disappeared. But it still felt like it was there. Where did it go? I jump out on the balcony. I get a picture of the two lower orbs. And they're on the website. Anybody who goes to the photo page, Phoenix Lights Network website, you'll see those two lower orbs in the lower left corner. But immediately noticed an eerie silence as if time had stopped. It was just bizarre. And as intently as I was watching those two lower orbs, I have to admit, which I did not for two years till after the mass sighting, that it felt like something was watching me. And going through my mind, I was thinking, who are you? What are you? Do you know that I'm here? I'd love to meet you. The next thing I remember, the left bottom orb started to shrink and cloak, just like the top one did. If we go here, Actually, I'd love to show that first picture if we can, and the topography. If you look on the left side there, left bottom, you'll see a car on the road. That's really significant because it shows how the light reflects onto the road, very unlike the true unknowns, where the light is self-contained. And this picture is important because if you go to the right of that car, you'll see skylights on a house to the right there, like a row of lights to the right, right there, which is interesting because they point out the topography where if you go straight up, you're gonna see South Mountain on the left and a few miles back, you'll see the Estrella Mountains on the right and they intersect right right above where those skylights are. Got that, John? Yeah. yeah. That? Um, an interesting story, <laughs> another little serendipity, um, which we'll get to, but I wanna get through the, the uh, 95 sighting first. If you go to that first picture in the 95 sighting, you'll see that um, there are two orbs in the lower left corner there. I want to make sure so, I got the right one you're talking about here. You Which row is right it there, on? right there. Oh, right here? Yeah. Oh, I see. There okay. we go. So the lower left corner there, you'll see the two orbs on the bottom there. Okay, and you see they don't they don't reflect onto the road, right? Mm -hmm. And to the right of that, you see the skylights. If you go straight up, if you if you shrink the picture a little bit, you'll see over the city, there's four lights. Now, we're going to get back to that, okay? Anyway, the next thing I remember, the left bottom orb started to shrink, and something told me to take a picture, and that's the next picture. That was the only one that turned out at the time. That's the last picture that I took. You got it. Now, you'll see that those lights not only moved to the right, and you can see the left bottom one is half disappeared. I can't believe it's miraculous that I even caught that. And the right one is still there. And you see the two lights above, right, with the arrow? Yeah. Okay. If you go back to that, to that first picture, and first of all, I didn't know who to show that one picture to. 
I knew no one who was interested in the topic. And, you know, I consider myself pretty educated, but I didn't know anything about the UFO topic. So uh, I just wondered for two years what this advanced technology, that's what hit me, advanced technology that was had an intelligence behind it was right outside our bedroom window. Didn't see anything remotely even close to that for two years. Now, while we're on these pictures, I will tell you a study that was done a year after the mass sighting. We had another sighting that some of that footage was, talk about amazing, over right through a frog. We had straight lines and mirror images. And the final thing was a giant pyramid in the same spot, by the way, as you're looking now um, at a distance. And um, anyway, uh, four of us caught north, south, east, and west, this 1998 sighting. And I had met with very few people at that point because I just wanted to have my pictures analyzed and find a logical explanation. And I met with Linda Moulton Howe, who uh, recommended that I show my data to Dr. Bruce McAbee, Navy optical physicist, very well respected mm -hmm. in the field. So I figured, okay, it's time to call him. So I called him up. I sent him the video from the four different people that took this big sighting in 98. And as an afterthought, and by then I had another picture, the first and the last picture, I sent that to him to find out, you know, what the close sighting was. He calls me two weeks later. He says, uh, Dr. Lynn, he says, um, you told me that that close sighting in 95 was only a couple minutes. I said, right. He said, are you sure? I said, absolutely. He said, well, ask your husband. Interestingly, now he was inside, I was outside. He didn't want to talk about it. He would get agitated when I brought up the closed sighting, which didn't make sense to me, because to me it was awesome and wonderful. And, it was, you know, you have to realize that everybody comes from a different background, from a different upbringing, from a different belief system. Some people can't deal with this topic. Some people don't want to, and that's okay. Everyone in their own time. And if you want to feed into a logical explanation, if it gives you comfort, so be it. But now there's data. And this really gets interesting because he said to me, you've got to cooperate with your husband. And I just sat my husband down. I said, look, we don't have to talk about the closed sighting. Mind you, this is three years later. But how long do you remember the closed sighting in 95 being? He says, I don't know, three, four minutes tops. I went back to Dr. Maccabee. He says, that's impossible. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at the pictures. Let's look at the pictures real, real quick again, because he was the first to notice that there were the same exact phenomena at a distance in the same exact location, we're going to get to that, that I would also photograph two months before the mass sighting and subsequently after the mass sighting and during the mass sighting as well. And he also noticed that the orbs, the closed orbs, moved from the left to the right in the last picture. Also, he says to me, that's not the most significant thing. He said, look at the skyline let's go back to the first picture because he says look at the skyline there are many lights on and not just individual lights but groups of lights on in the first picture that are off in the last picture he said that doesn't happen in a couple minutes he said i want you to do an experiment he was very meticulous in his research he said stand on the balcony approximately the same place you were standing in 95 take a picture of the skyline and of course this is three years later but nonetheless Take a picture of the skyline one night every hour, the next night every half hour. And I actually did it another night every 15 minutes to see when these groups of lights go out. Well, I usually take a bath between seven and eight. So let's be conservative and say eight o'clock starting point. The lights start going out at nine o'clock. The last picture, if you want to go to that one, the second one, is indicative of 1030 11 o'clock and he actually did it again a few years back for national geographic show and had better software and saw that there were more lights that went that were on in the first picture that were off in the last picture and he asked me um can i present this case in the upcoming 1999 mufon mutual ufo network international symposium and i said hey dr maccabee this is your baby i would have never ever realized this data just do me one big favor keep my name out of it. I really wanted to stay anonymous. <laughs> and he presented the case in 1999 in Washington, D.C., the um, MUFON International Symposium as the first, and to this day, the only that we know of, authenticated photographic evidence of missing time. 
Now, I couldn't wrap my head around that. <laughs> I still can't. But be that as it may, I didn't even put it in my first book in 2004 uh, when I came forward. It wasn't until 2010. And the reason that I shared it then, um, because the response to the book was, was just so phenomenal and people really appreciated the, the dedication of the work that went into it. I pushed my whole medical career aside for seven years to find a logical explanation, which I have yet to find. But the point with the missing time is that if that can open the door maybe to more research by scientists that to show that linear time, our view of time is primitive, past, present and future may not be what time is. Plus, by then, uh, physics itself has gotten so advanced to say that there might be 10 or 11 different dimensions out there. Well, if there are other times and spaces along with ours, then why is it so inconceivable that there couldn't be sentient, intelligent beings in those other times and spaces that we get glimpses of if we're open to them or invited? So that's why I, I eventually shared it and I'm sharing it today. I just started sharing it with yeah. in the yeah. podcast, but I wanted to let your viewers who are very sophisticated, um, as, as you are, uh, with the data, uh, know this part, because this is really important data. Now, we fast forward two years. Um, we can put a hold on that for a sec. And I hadn't seen anything, anything remotely similar to those close lights. And until two months before the mass sighting, I'm lying in bed and I notice out of the big picture window, three amber orbs in a row now, totally equidistant from each other, hovering for minutes, huge, but they were at a distance in the West. And I thought, wait a minute, they're amber. They're in a formation. They're hovering for minutes. And each one actually shrunk from right to left. And I thought, wow, very similar to 95. And I mentioned it to my husband. Again, he didn't want to talk about anything. He said, do I still have to go to work tomorrow? We would make a joke out of it. And the next night he was at a medical board meeting. And I'm standing and I got upstairs and I see out of the sliding glass door that's perpendicular to the big window that I had stepped out. Uh, in 95, the same three orbs are now at a distance, but in front of South Mountain. And I knew they were in front of South Mountain because there's red blinking lights on the top of the mountain to alert airplanes coming into Sky Harbor, which is just in front of South Mountain. And I thought, OK, enough. I run upstairs, grab my video camera. I get about 18 seconds worth. The battery goes dead. I run inside. I hook it up. I go outside. They're gone. My husband comes up the end is about eight o'clock. He comes up the drive about 830 and I go outside. I said, remember um, last night I told you about the three orbs in a uh, in a line far west. Well, last just half an hour ago, they were right in front of South Mountain. As I'm pointing like this, they reappear in the same spot. I kid you not. And I was like, whoa, I got to get a picture. And that's another little coincidence because in video, it doesn't do the lights justice. They're much smaller, they're white, they flicker. Nonetheless, to the trained eye, the formations are very compelling. But I run upstairs, I grab my 35 millimeter, I get out to shoot the three. Suddenly, six lights across, massive span, over a mile wide, pop on above the three. And it was unnerving, <laughs> I have to tell you. Not having an explanation for 95, I started to shake. I thought, oh my goodness, is this a mothership or a fleet? And keep in mind, I don't think about UFO stuff, but that's what popped in my head. Go to the next picture, if you would. Thank you. And you will see. Uh, that, 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 that one okay. there? I, I, don't, I don't see it. It's oh, oh, kind of oh, wavy. so sorry. Yeah, I apologize. That's okay. Oh, there that. we go. There we go. Yes. You'll see that it's wavy because I was shaking. <laughs> okay. But... I kept my wits about me, thank goodness, and I kept clicking away. The second picture, John, to me, and, and you're so knowledgeable, to me, it's a smoking gun. That second picture, if you, we can go to the, the next one. This one here? Right, right there. Is five lights. It looks like a five lights in a V with two underneath. Thousands of people. Now, mind this, this is January 97. Two months later, during the mass sighting, would describe what they saw whether it was just lights or actual craft, five lights in a V formation with two trailing lights. This is two months before the mass sighting. Same thing. And in science, we look for repeatability, right? Yeah, yeah. John? And if I can jump in and ask you uh, sure. one question, I have one about the missing time, but we'll get back to that. Uh, the, the 
area that you live in, obviously, I'm sure you had already talked about all the objects that you see. Just to kind of you know, cut off at the pass, anybody who's watching that goes, well, maybe they were aircraft flares as you describe them slowly going out. We see flares. Right, yeah. and, and that's what I want to get to. So you obviously see those too. Very quickly, can you explain to those out there uh, that may have that question, what is the difference when you see an obvious aircraft flare? And I know this will come up I more will when get we to talk it. about the mass. I will definitely, yeah, yeah I, I will know it will come up more. It. But it's a great question because these orbs, as I described, the light did not extend outside the edge, okay? And they don't budge. They're rock solid, okay? Flares don't do that, okay? Especially at the time, military illumination flares. They drift and drop. They're dropped from aircraft on, and we'll get to that, uh, with, a, with a big parachute. And they drift with the wind haphazardly. And what's significant, and not one person that saw the true unknowns called the Phoenix Lights, describe this were huge smoke trails that are illuminated by the flare itself and they're meant to illuminate the area around it so that they're heat seeking and the missiles that might be coming towards a plane will seek towards the flare instead nobody ever described any of that and we're going to get to that because there's a very important call that i got from the uh, air national guard uh, a month after a front page usa today article but i want to get ahead of myself no no so, no that's okay and that was exactly what i was looking for because it is very interesting to hear that from you, to hear that you are well acquainted with those aircraft flares and obviously skeptics and debunkers, they want to throw that out there whenever there's a nighttime sighting of orbs of that, you know, have a flickering out light, they immediately go there. So the fact that you know the difference and can adequately explain it, exactly what I was looking for. Uh, just really quickly about the, the missing time, which was a really interesting point. Um, I believe, and forgive me, I don't recall the camera you said you used. Was it a digital camera or film? I think no, you said film. That's, that's what's so unique about my photographic collection is that I was using a 35 millimeter camera. Yeah, They're gotcha. in the negative. That's what's so powerful about my data. And one of the reasons I also had to come forward, not only as a scientist to show the data, um, as a physician to let people know they're not crazy, even the most anomalies can be explained. And also, if you keep it inside, uh, people that have paranormal experiences, it's real to them. And it's it's it festers. It's, it's uh, cathartic to share mm -hmm. it, even with just one person. And as an experiencer, I knew what that felt like. And as an educator um, for vital issues, for 40 years um now going on 50 um it, it you know how could i not share this data and and this is really important data and that's one of the main big big points the difference and we'll get to that i have pictures to show and it's just the data speaks for itself the difference between true unknowns and uh flares which is the only explanation that the military and government ever came up with and they had to come up with something we're going to get to that um because it's amazing how the story unfolded um it's uh it's it's very it's fun to talk about it but it's also interesting to to see how the story unfolded because if we go to the next picture and i'll get through these quickly for you um in this series and again they're in the negative they cannot be manipulated or changed it's in the negative as i'm watching this head-on the top formation turned into a V. You can see as the three on the bottom are starting to disappear, the top formation is starting to turn. And the last one, you can even see um, that every other one is bigger than the one in between. If we can go to the next picture. There we go. And this has all been analyzed by military and university optical experts throughout the years. The head of the optical science department at University of Arizona took a big, big interest in uh, my data um, and, and the story itself and uh, actually got a whole group together of big scientists to, to study this, um, as well as uh, Brooks Institute of Photography and Dr. Bruce McAbee and, and, and many others. Um, and what was deciphered from this is that every other one is bigger than the one in between. So that we might be looking at a V where uh, the bigger orbs are the closer arm and the further away orbs are the smaller ones. Very interesting. Could, I mean, I, I, and this is really important, John. Yeah. <laughs> I ran inside as the ones were disappearing on the bottom to call the Arizona Republic and say, get somebody out there quick, there's strange lights in front of South Mountain and um, take some, get somebody to take a picture 
by the time I finished my sentence, they were gone. Didn't sleep well that night. The next morning I got up, I figured, look, there's got to be a logical explanation. I called the Arizona Republic again and asked if anybody had thrown them to report strange lights in front of South Mountain. She gets off. She gets right back on. She said, nope, nobody called. Well, I know I called. So I said, look, we saw something really unusual. He says, sometimes Luke Air Force Base, and this is for the other people out there that, that you know, and I, that's fine. I mean, you know, there's lots of stuff in our skies now, including other things, drones and satellites and all. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to call Luke Air Force Base and see if there was some kind of experimental maneuver or something, right? I try to be very professional. My husband and I are both physicians. We live mountainside in Paradise Valley. We saw some strange lights in front of South Mountain. Do you know what they might have been? And from the get-go, she had an attitude. And she said, they didn't come into Luke Air Force Base and they didn't come out from here. So we had nothing to do with it. I said, be that as it may, we did see them. And I even got pictures of them. How can I find out what they were? She said, well, you said it was near the airport. Why don't you call them? Okay, now it was a mission. I called the FAA, told her the same thing. Very nice girl. She gets off, she gets back on. She says, there actually was a group of air traffic controllers here last night that did see some strange lights in front of South Mountain. And actually, they were over Class B restricted airspace. Now, I said, could I please talk to one, well, at least one of them to see if we saw the same thing? Again, trying to be as scientific as I could. Finally, he gets back, he gets on the phone. And I met him subsequently, really low key guy. He was more excited than me. He said, did you see this six times before you could test them from each other at 8.30 last night? I said, yes, I saw them. He said, actually there were three at eight o'clock. I saw them too. And he was thrilled that I saw them at a distance. When this popped up a thousand feet altitude, they got alarmed because there's a 30 mile radius around the center of the airport. Anyone that comes into that airspace, particularly a thousand feet that these were, they must call into the tower and no one did. So they looked on radar, didn't show up on radar, took their high powered binoculars to look. And we're talking about professional sky watchers here. And in his own words, he said there were six points of light, totally equidistant from each other, massive span over a mile wide that seemed to be attached to something, but they couldn't quite see what they were attached to. And he was a meteorologist and said the entire thing turned as a unit against the wind and elevated slowly and moved in synchrony behind South Mountain, as if they were attached to something or at a rock solid force field in between. So I said, well, so what were they? And there was silence. And then he said, beats me. I said, you're an air traffic controller. You're supposed to know what's in our airspace. They ruled out, John, every conventional aircraft, balloons, Chinese lanterns, flares, um, uh, you name it, holograms, uh, and even, uh, skydivers with lights. That was one of the things they ruled out. We kept in contact. I continued photographing these lights. And see, that's why this data is really important because it's two years and two months before the mass sighting. It wasn't just March 13th, which everybody focuses on, especially the skeptics and debunkers. Okay. Yeah. They've got to know and learn if they choose that there is, and that's why I had to come forward. There's much more to the story. Anyway, on March 13th, 1997, that was just another night to me. And previously, a couple of weeks before, my husband was getting a little annoyed with me running out and taking pictures every time I saw these lights. Again, the scientist in me. And I thought, OK, I've got to start showing the video to my friends and find out if anybody knows anybody I can show this to. This is how close I was. A friend of a friend had a neighbor who had a friend who knew the past president of MUFON, Mutual UFM Network, which I had never heard of before. And he hooks me up with a field investigator to, to meet with him on the following Wednesday, who calls me on Tuesday because the then state director wanted to be there. His mom had passed on Saturday. The funeral was Wednesday morning. Could we postpone? I said, whoa, I am so busy for another two, three weeks. I have a little opening Friday morning at 10. He said, great. I knock on his door. He opens the door. The first thing he says to me is, did you see the mass sighting last night? And I saw, I, I saw something very similar to what I told you about two months ago. Um, in fact, it looked like the same exact thing. And, and I got video uh, of it. He says, great, because NBC, who I had done health tips for in the early 80s in Phoenix, was coming to interview him in a half an hour. I said, whoa, whoa. I said, first of all, I don't know what we're dealing with here. Is it military or a hoax? or whatever, but it's not about me. It's never been about me, John, it's about the data. And I said, take a copy of the video, share it with whoever, I'm out of here. Oh, and by the way, I called the air traffic controllers this morning because it looked like the same thing in the same spot and they confirmed that it was. It was at thousand feet altitude over class B restricted airspace. Plus 
a couple of pilots called in a commercial airline pilot who was on departure said what the hell are these lights over me and a private pilot called in who we're going to get to later who said that he was on close approach and saw the five lights in a v which is initially what i saw too mm-hmm. and when i got out to the to the balcony to shoot it they had turned or whatever and i caught the three uh end points of a giant v or triangle and so in other words, he was saying it and reporting it while I was filming it, which we'll get to later, an interesting uh, person um, who it was. But I even put it in my book, in the original book, because I thought, wow, pilots saw it too, and it was over class beer received airspace. And I said, you know, it was the same exact thing. And I said, I'm out of here. And I left. And at four o'clock, the first news that came on in the afternoon, I was sitting in front of my VCR. And every, you know, how they do breaking news, every news station he gave it to everyone (laughs) had my video up there it was really exciting john to tell you the truth i mean having seen these things and documenting them for two years and now finding out that thousands of people saw what i had been seeing and and here i wanted to show them what what i had seen uh by the nine o'clock news a couple other videos came out now this is also significant because my video and another video an arrowhead of five lights uh interestingly steve blonder another witness, and there were others who were seeing these lights along with me for, for a couple of weeks before, and he called MUFON up to his balcony and actually captured a, a, a kind of a, an arrowhead of five lights before 10 o'clock. There were a couple of boomerang videos, and they've been the ones that have been under fire for being placed, shot after 10 o'clock. We'll get to that as well. But anyway, on March 13th, <clears throat> for anybody who doesn't know out there, and by the way, There is so much mis- and disinformation out there. I am here today to share the data, the real data, to set the record straight. Because it wasn't just one or two events, as you would hear in the media. It was many events, and not just for a couple hours. Yes, between 8 and 10 is when most people were outside that evening on a very clear, beautiful evening, looking up at the sky for a glimpse of the Hale-Bob Comet when they also caught a glimpse of a mile. And we learned from Peter Davenport for the 20th anniversary, we were in Oregon at a conference for celebrating the Phoenix Lights. And he actually shared from his data at the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle that one of these objects, whether it was orbs that seemed to be attached to something or actual craft was eight miles wide. I thought he was kidding, but he has confirmed it several times after. And not only Con- confirmed in what confirmed way? Confirmed that it was eight miles wide, whatever this phenomenon was, whatever this UAP was. But using and witness testimony or yes, witness. Okay. He's gotten hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Just go to the National UFO Reporting Center mm-hmm. and click Phoenix Light. He has pictures and drawings and all kinds of stuff. It's phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> plus, not only was it massive, okay, but we're talking that. The mass sighting actually started on March 13th at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. There were daylight sightings in Arizona. Five o'clock hour, there were reports from Native Americans in New Mexico. Seven o'clock hour and beyond in California. The 10 o'clock hour, there were two commercial airline pilots who were approaching Las Vegas who called in and it took one of them. She's female and she took years to get in touch with me. But and then I found out there was another one as well. Um, they called in to radar to ask what this massive craft was covering Las Vegas. And the sightings continued till 5.30 the next morning. The last report that I got personally from a very credible Boeing crewman who told me that his whole crew was coming in to work at Sky Harbor International Airport and one of these over mile wide craft was hovering over their tarmac. So we're talking not only over a dozen hours multiple things happening at the same time in four different states okay so this is data that most people have no idea unless they've mm-hmm. read my book or or hear me um at a, a conference or, or like this so i appreciate letting me share this sure, the other sure. thing that's really interesting is that it wasn't just these orb light formations that seemed to be attached to something or had a force field holding them in rock solid either v or boomerang or delta or triangle formations but there were multiple craft. If you go on the GAP page, GAP, Geospatial Animation Project, on the Phoenix Lights Network website, 
beautifully illustrated by Larry Lowe, and there's animations there as well. It was a 12 year study, meticulous study by the investigators here in Phoenix. Two or more people had to see the same craft. And if you, if you scroll down, you'll see some of the craft. There were that, now by the way, there were, that shows that there were multiple things happening. That's just an hour <laughs> happening just in, over Phoenix at the same time. And if you scroll down, you'll see some of the other craft. Now, whether it was one craft, and there were 10 different crafts, by the way, one craft that could morph to look different, and they look very different, or it was the perspective from where the person was standing, or an actual parade. And ultimately, that's just keep on scrolling down. You'll see they're very different. Um, and I, there you go. That one, by the way, that one, I found a video and you can see that each light is composed of three lights. I found the video from Russia, St. Petersburg, Russia, and it's right about the same times of us as, as we had the mass sighting with showing a V shape with every light is three lights. So uh, you decide for yourself if you scroll down that, that as well. There you go. There's the three lights. And then um, also what people were seeing were not only these multiple craft. Now, whether it was one craft that could morph into looking different, the perspective from where the person was standing or a parade. And if you scroll down even more, you're going to see. Look at that. I mean, just totally different. There's a triangle that went over a hospice group. And that's what um, uh, our governor saw. We'll talk about that a bit, little bit later. One of these craft actually split in two and, and shot up. Other people saw these orbs like that one detach from the main object, go out into the environment and then redock with it later. Is that what happened in 95? I'll leave that up to you. And even after, by the way, after midnight, there was a pilot out in Carefree with his son who saw a disc-shaped object. And just a few years ago, a fella from Prescott came forward to very, very meticulously describe that what he saw was, and if we go down further, a boomerang. And we have another witness that also, and, and there's some of the uh, um, animations for you, um, who also saw this boomerang coming over uh, Camelback Mountain. So there was a lot of stuff happening at the same time over four states, 10 different craft, if there were different, or maybe it was one that could more for the perspective. Um, but there was so much happening. And the technology itself, John, I mean, we're talking the massiveness of this thing without a sound totally silent some people saw it take off at blink speed without even dispersing the air what do we have now that even comes close 25 years since there's nothing that we know of that even comes close to this kind of technology and we find out and we have a recording in our documentary from an alleged crewman from Luke Air Force Base who called the National UFO Reporting Center at 3 a.m. the next morning, very professional, very detailed, that jets were sent off from Luke Air Force Base to intercept one of these craft that was hovering right over central Phoenix. And we have civilians that saw this happening, by the way. And we have one of them that's coming up in our, our big uh, uh, March 20th, we celebrate the Phoenix Light at the Scottsdale Hark and Shea Theater. And she'll be sharing her sighting of seeing these jets approach one of these massive craft over central Phoenix. As it got, as it got close, the light started to dim. And then the entire thing blinked out and disappeared. Talk about technology and freaked out one of the pilots who this uh, alleged crewman said that he helped out of his aircraft. So we're talking about multiple things happening for over a dozen hours in four different states and incredible technology. And yet. No investigation, no explanation for months. It was bizarre i mean we would the the uh, elected officials would be a person who said oh what something happened on march 13th and we're talking about rooftop level some people said that they could have thrown a rock at it it was that close just miraculous data and yet there was nothing for months in may former phoenix vice mayor councilwoman francis barwood innocently because so many of her constituents she got over a thousand calls asked why isn't there an investigation asked for one and she was plastered i have to tell you john in, in 97 there was so much ridicule and snickering and discrediting of any of the witnesses that came forward or anybody that inquired about it i was very happy because uh, the week after 
the mass lighting. I see my video on TV and they're interviewing a fella right in Tempe, right near Arizona State University at a big computer lab, Jim Delatoso, who was showing pictures that he was studying on the side from all over the world for like 20 years of the same exact phenomena of these orbs and triangle formations from Russia and Belgium and UK. And, and I mean, that blew me away. And that day I started to keep a journal. I pushed my whole medical career aside, accomplished medical career aside, the final logical explanation and kept an, a diary every day media reports, military reports, um, you name it, even talking to witnesses, which we're going to get to because in real time and long term, just the effect on them was just phenomenal. But just to let the story unfold a little bit, um, I was very happy to stay anonymous after the Farwick thing because they had little jokes in the paper about her and all that. Okay, we <clears throat> fast forward. June 18th, months later, front page USA Today article, suddenly, People from outside of Arizona were hearing about our mass sighting for the first time. And we didn't have social media at the time. And yet overnight, it went viral. And we were deluged from me, by media from all over the world. Not only that, but every mo national morning show, Peter Jennings, uh, Dan Rather, you name it, were talking about the Phoenix Lights. And the late morning on the following day, because... The, all the reporters, when they talked to the witnesses, they too were saying their reports are so detailed and so hard. So why isn't there an investigation? Why isn't there an explanation? The very next day, the 19th, by late morning, it was a big public announcement that our former Governor Symington was calling a press conference for that afternoon, unscheduled, to reveal the culprit of the lights over Phoenix. And people took it seriously. And there were media there. There were parents there. He comes marching out one of his aides with a giant alien head costume and made a mockery of it, which was really disconcerting, especially for parents that were with children that saw something two and three miles wide. And he's making a joke out of it. It wasn't a joke, especially for me. OK, I saw these things up close and personal. And now thousands of other people saw what I had been seeing. I called every military base that next month. And they were more interested in seeing my daughter. They wanted to meet with me and I didn't tell them anything, no details. I just wanted to know what was going on. They were just as curious. In fact, one of them, and I have it in the book, said, well, the only people that know this are God and whoever did this. That was his answer, okay? I get a call on July 24th from one of the heads of PR at the Air National Guard. Oh, Dr. Lynn, I think we know what those lights were back in March. And I was thrilled. I was looking for any logical explanation. She says, do you believe that nobody has ever looked at the log for visiting Air National Guard and the Maryland Air National Guard was in town sending off military illumination flares in Operation Snowbird. And you probably know that that, that means diversionary tactical maneuvers in military terms. And they may have sent off some flares to divert attention away, but not one witness, as I mentioned earlier, describes what flares do. She said, that must be what some people saw. And I said, wait a minute. Um, when was the Maryland Air National Guard in town? She said, March 1st to the 15th. I said, were they in town in January? She said, oh, no. I said, are you sure? She said, absolutely not. I said, well, my husband and I saw the same exact phenomena in the same exact location two months before the mass sighting, plus confirmed the next morning in January and the morning after the mass sighting by air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport as being over class B restricted airspace at thousand feet altitude. And she says, you never told me that. I said, besides, you're trying to tell me that flares, and I had educated myself to anything, including flares, that cannot keep a formation. As I mentioned earlier, drift and drop with the wind haphazardly on a parachute uh, within seconds, uh, minutes at the, at the most to the ground, have huge smoke trails illuminated by a flare itself, illuminate the ground itself. Not one person described that. And you're trying to tell me that flares traveled in a rock solid, equidistantly spaced, mile wide V for hours. And she says, uh, I have a call coming in. I'll get back to you. Well, I'm still waiting, John. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, we fast forward. I'm almost done. We fast forward because um, it's so interesting. There's so much more to the story, but I'm giving you the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, big, big, big things that happened, which 10 years after the mass sighting, for whatever reason, our former governor who had mocked the sighting in 97 uh, came forward to disclose that he actually saw one of these crafts and that it definitely wasn't flares and in his own words which other countries i found out were saying the same using the same word it was otherworldly 
which is a big step forward, okay? The more credible people that come forward, the more credibility to the whole uh, Phoenix Lights mass sighting. Plus, right after the New York Times had a front page article about the study that Harry Reid funded, $22 million study of UAP, Unexplained Aerial Phenomena, and military and uh, uh, government were admitting that they were studying it. Shortly after then, the pilot, that private pilot, who uh, I had no idea who it was, um, came forward and it happened to be actor Kurt Russell. And his story is really amazing in itself because he describes in a UK uh, interview, very, very uh, detailed and, and terrific interview, that he forgot about it for two years. And we have witnesses, including in my book, a psychiatrist with his family that was coming up from Tucson to Phoenix, towers away. And one of these craft was right above their car. On, and he said the wingspan was was over the, the ground on either side of this giant highway for some time. And he saw the bottom of I mean, people saw gunmetal and beings at the windows. I mean, it's phenomenal when you when you hear the description. Um, they forgot about it, too. Nobody said a word. And they all you, saw it. Can I heart. interject really sure. quick? How do you yeah. forget about that? Like, I mean, you would think that that would be just a mind-blowing experience that you just would not forget. Is there some type of psychological explanation i mean you're a medical doctor is there some kind of of uh ptsd thing like wh what explains that like i said earlier some people can't deal with it some people don't want to um what what kurt russell said is that he totally he was with his son who saw it and and usually kids by the way were were the first to see and i want to get into that in a second too um this big b coming towards him um and oliver he was a more of an adult, um, was the one to alert his dad about this coming towards the airport, and they never talked about it. And two years passed, and he came home to Goldie Hawn, uh, and she was watching a show, and they were talking about the Phoenix Lights, and he said, wait a minute, that sounds familiar, like a Richard Dreyfuss movie. Um, and he, he goes to his log and sees that that was him, that he was a pilot <laughs> that called into the tower. So yes, there were, it, it is so fascinating and that would take another hour to talk about and I wanna get into that a little teeny bit because um, we are so inundated with threat, threat, threat and harm, harm, harm from media, from the from Hollywood, that Dr. Gary Schwartz, who's the head of the Consciousness Study Department at the University of Arizona makes a very poignant statement in the documentary. He said, if you're um, just, just hearing about something that you should be uh, afraid of. How do you think you're gonna feel when you see that something that you should be afraid of, right? So uh, Independence Day movie was very popular at the time, right before the Phoenix Lights. And children, as I said, were usually the first ones to alert their parents. This giant V was coming towards them and, and shouting, Independence Day, Independence Day. But as it got close, interestingly, a calmness came over everyone adults and children as well, a connectedness to the phenomena that after it passed, not only did the kids want to run after it or have their uh, parents get in a car and chase it, but when you look at the data, it's unbelievable. There is not one, not one credible report in 25 years now of harm, threat, or abduction associated with the Phoenix Lights phenomena. I can't speak for other things, but I can speak for the Phoenix Lights. If anything, it was just the opposite. People were in awe and in wonder. So many cars pulled off the road because they were curious. I, I have more people tell me to this day that they feel blessed that they had the experience. And also, interestingly, a number of witnesses, including the psychiatrist that I interviewed, told me that they had had near-death experiences as children that was reawakened by the mass sighting. And that really hit me hard because I did too. We would have time to get into it and I lay it all out there in the book. But I thought, whoa, I could, could there possibly be a connection between all unexplained phenomena, not not only near death experience, but out of body experience, out of body, um, as well as unexplained aerial phenomena that have mystical light 
associated with the experience. And lo and behold, again, just like the UFO phenomena, there's a plethora of credible data out there. I started looking at university-based studies, the Omega Project at the University of Connecticut, Dr. Kenneth Ring, like a three-inch book, as well as Dr. John Mack at Harvard, the Peer Institute, um, as well as uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson and, and Dr. Stuart Tremblow, near-death experience experts. They were all coming to the same conclusion and by the way, my first interview a month before I came forward in 2004 was with Dr. John Mack at the Tucson Medical Center. And he was so grateful that I presented my data because it confirmed his data of people that had been contacted or abducted. And he was writing a book just about this. And he wanted me to help, help with him uh, and, and to join him in that effort. And then he was unfortunately um, killed in a car accident six months later. But the point is that the experience itself whatever the unexplained phenomena experience, near death, out of body, unexplained area phenomena with a mystical light is very, very simple, very, very similar. And I lay it out very simply in the book. But what I describe to you as a timelessness, as um, seeing a light and the uh, feeling um, as if time had stopped and if there was intelligent presence there and um, getting, getting a message and not, uh, it was the same thing. I mean, they, there's different points and I point them out uh, all in the book are very similar, but the most profound, powerful data is the after effect, the profound, positive awakening, the enlightenment that happens within an individual who has an unexplained phenomena experience. I start calling them all and up because it is so positive. The connectedness that one feels to the universe, the earth, to each other, that has probably never been felt by that individual before. And you don't have to have an up experience to, to have that positive transformation. All you need to do is open your mind and your heart and learn about it. And and soon you'll start noticing serendipities and, and coincidences and um it's just amazing how it transforms your your whole life to a new worldview. It's not a belief anymore, John. When people say, do you believe in UFOs? It's a knowing. Do you have an idea after everything that you've seen, experienced, uh, obviously have witnessed quite a few times, what is then yours from your scientific background that you've referenced uh as you investigated this and wanted to document it and and think about it what are you dealing with great question uh as i mentioned i don't know what these are but i know that they are and it's time we get it out in the open and 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 we do address it and we do accept it and you know some people won't be able to for a while but the data is there if you you want to open your mind and your heart and you learn about it and and study these study the data and i think that the military and the government have been doing this for a very long time uh, that's a whole other conversation um but at least it's out in the open now and that snickering and ridicule and discrediting that's been rampant for so many years is starting to dissipate that's the good news and um whoever did this and that i can say Whoever did this, and we don't know. We don't know, John. Is it intrastellar, intrastellar, interdimensional, which I saw it up close and personal, and I can attest to that, okay? There's an interdimensional component to this. Uh, time travelers, uh, a runaway society, as some experts think. Um, and, and now we're seeing submersibles as well being uh, presented to the public. And we know that we see these UAP uh, going into the ocean, coming out from the ocean. I mean, they could have been here for millennia. Uh, so I don't know who's doing it, but I know that what they're doing and what they did on March 13th, 1997 is touch one person at a time, which I'm trying to do with my own data. But what they did was wake up one person at a time to not only their presence in a non-threatening, gentle way, but also to wake that person up to the potential we have as human beings to what we're doing to our planet before it's too late. And Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who's in our documentary, said the same exact thing. He actually quotes it in the documentary that we are stewards of this planet. And whoever's doing this is really trying to wake us up to that and wake us up to the positive potential we have as human beings to make this world a better world. And if I can be a credible voice, it's not about me, it's about the data. But if I can be a credible voice, so people actually look at the data, then I've done my job.
And thank you for listening today to the, no, no, to no, the no, bits of the inside story. <laughs> and before I, 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 you know, as we wrap up here uh, in the next 10, 10 minutes or so or 15, I want to make sure we, we cover everything. But one thing that I wanted to talk about and make sure that I asked you about was that military explanation. Now, you've already went through your phone calls and their attempts to sometimes explain it uh-huh. and then later dodge you. Um, just to throw this out to you, and I, and I want to know kind of what your reaction was. I, I kind of know part of it just because we've known each other or when we first met, we talked about it. Uh, but I had done a FOIA request to try and figure out what this you know, uh, uh, object was in March. Obviously, I was focusing uh, in on the mass sighting, the one in March, uh, not the previous ones you were talking about. people didn't know. Exactly. Yeah. And and, uh, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's, and that's what I wanted to say. There was, there was nothing else to me to investigate because we didn't know. Uh, But the March 13th sighting, and let me go ahead and pull up the letter that, uh, uh, that I got here. This is from the blackvault.com. Anybody can just, I'll I'll link everything that we're talking about in the show notes below. For those who aren't aware with this channel, uh, I will uh, always link over to pages. And if I ever forget, let me know. Uh, but uh, anything that uh, Dr. Kitai and I are talking about will be down below. And while you're there, hit the thumbs up button. It's a big help for this channel. But that being said, the FOIA response that I had gotten, I want to read this to you and then kind of just get your reaction to all of this. This was, again, the official letter from Luke Air Force Base, uh, which is at the time, back in 1997, uh, where I was told uh, these aircraft flares came from. And so, naturally, any FOIA requester would go to Luke Air Force Base. And here's the quote. On the evening of 13 March 1997, our command post and other base agencies received telephone calls about the lights that many saw in the sky over Arizona. In the days that followed... Our public affairs office also handled calls about the same subject. When queried by the staff of the Strange Universe television program, our public affairs people acknowledged that callers reported seeing lights in the sky, but our staff did not state that the cause was aerial flares. In fact, we don't know where the question of aerial flares came from. There have been a number of accounts of the 13 March 97 incident that alleged Air Force involvement. And we have made every effort to ensure that callers understood that we were not involved in that incident. However, despite our best efforts to the contrary, we've been accused of withholding or covering up. And the letter goes on. So my question to you is, uh, and this is kind of racking my brain because it goes back so many years. Um, but where did that aerial flare explanation come from? Great question. And there's one other thing that I have to share that I'm mm-hmm. sure people aren't aware except the people right here in phoenix number one at the end of that FOIA, it says that we had nothing the military had nothing to do with it that's what that's got me (laughs) okay now we're talking after the usa today article came out and we were deluged by media from all over the world and again they were asking why isn't there an investigation why isn't there an explanation they had to come up with something because there was just too much talk it was all over national news international news Whoever came up with the flare theory was brilliant because there's a handful of videos from that night, including my own and Steve Blonders and MUFON before 10 o'clock. But the boomerang video, which was also being shown quite a bit, had to be put to rest. And whoever came up with the flare thing was brilliant because, as I said, the the video doesn't do it justice. It's smaller, it's white, they flicker. But if you look at that formation, it doesn't budge. In fact, I just posted on Facebook uh, on the Phoenix Lights Network page a study that was done just a few years ago with more, you know, advanced technology showing the stabilization. They didn't budge. And and one of them actually elevated and split in two. But whoever came up with the flare theory was was brilliant because people could easily... you know, mistake them for flares. The other thing, okay, from the video itself, not my 35 millimeter, but from the video. Um, Another thing that's really important to import, and I'm so glad you brought this up, is three years after the mass sighting, then Councilman Francis Barwood, Vice Mayor of Phoenix, actually was running on Secretary of Secretary of State to get answers for the Phoenix lights the lights over Phoenix, and she was asking for a reenactment, which was brilliant. Show me. I mean, shame on them if it was military and they went right over people's heads and they denied it for so long, but show me, okay? I'm open. Well, we got an announcement right before the third anniversary, and this says it all. 
by three Air National Guards, I believe it was New York, Michigan, and California, if I'm not mistaken, that they were coming into town to show everyone the Phoenix Lights. Well, I have to tell you, talk about a joke. And if you go on the news page on the Phoenix Lights Network website and scroll down a bit, you'll see AZ Family News. It was a CNN affiliate at the time. And it shows what they did. They tried to reenact it. It was a dire failure for them. They tried to make a triangle. It was upside down. It fell apart immediately. It had huge smoke trails, just what flares do. To this day, the Phoenix Lights have never been recreated or explained. And yet these phenomena continue to show worldwide. The Phoenix Lights have become the most witnessed, most documented, most important mass anomalous sighting in modern history, if not all of history. And when people see similar phenomena, whether it's these orbs and rock solid arrays of V or boomerang or whatever, or actual V or triangle craft, they look up and say, wow, there's the Phoenix Lights. And that's pretty cool. Worldwide. What do you feel? And this will be my last my last question to you. And then uh, if there's anything else you want to cover, but what do you think the biggest misconception is and, and the biggest piece of disinformation, if you haven't covered it already, about this event that people just don't understand for whatever reason, whether the media be to blame or maybe just people outside of, of that particular area really just don't talk about it. But what do you feel is that single most piece of biggest disinformation that you would love to clear up? Certainly the flare theory, um, people that were looking for a logical explanation fed right into it. And there was a show, I mean, there's so much more to the story and I get into it in detail in the book. They came into town called Anatomy of Sighting that uh, in August, the following August, and I have no idea who is funding it, but when I met with the producer, he wouldn't even look at my data. He just blew it off because I thought it's important for people to know there's more to the story. It wasn't just March 13th. He wouldn't even look at my dad. He says, ah, the, the military said it was flares. They had already decided. And that's what they did in the film. They took, and this is what did it to the, to the boomerang um, uh, formation uh, the, of March 13th. They took that video and tried to show that it went behind the mountain. So it must be flares sent off by the military. And by the way, with your FOIA report, David Monson also came up with, they were sending off flares. There were too many in the plane. So on the way back to Tucson, they were sending off flares. So they kept changing their stories with the flare thing. So, you know, if you take that to the back as well, I mean, it was very, uh, one hand didn't know what the other hand was doing. And, and a lot of misinformation got out there at the time about the flares anyway. But just because it went, these lights went behind the mountain, as I described earlier, the air traffic controllers saw this massive, formation of lights that seem to be attached to something move in synchrony as a unit behind south mountain so just because it moved behind the mountain doesn't mean it's flares that's number one number two as far as you know fast forwarding to now um and and knowing that what happened in that show they actually had a report one of the reporters at one of the stations actually saw the craft and he wanted to get to the bottom of it and he interviewed Kristen. Mike Kristen, who shot that boomerang, and they did an amazing, amazing report that I show in conferences now, where it shows in their show that when he took that footage, there is a tree on the right side, there in, on his property, and there is a light on the right side of that tree that's separate from that boomerang, that in their program is on the left side of that tree. So it is just blatantly manipulated to show that those boomerang lights conform to the mountain to make the case for flares. And they showed that show. That program aired Thanksgiving, Christmas, over and over and over and over. Someone was making the point. And I even called the producer and I said, look, there's more to the story and I have other data. If you had this, you know, footage analyzed, you know, I'm open, analyze my data. He says, well, you know, um, you know, uh, well, if we ever get more funding, I'll, I'll let you know. So I always wondered who funded that show. <laughs> but besides the flare thing, okay. Um, there's so much misinformation to just the timing, okay, which we've gone through today. And I hope that the people will take a look at the book because there's so much more. The Phoenix Lights, a skeptic's discovery that we are not alone. I just keep adding chapters. It's in its fourth print. I had a 750 page journal 
seven years later that I didn't know what to do with John. I really did not want to come forward. People that did were just plastered to the wall. Um, I was an accomplished physician. I went back to work to help put our younger son through medical school um, at the Arizona Heart Institute as a chief clinical consultant there and behind closed doors. I took that 750 page journal and edited it down to 230 pages of the most important credible data. Every word is there for a reason. And once I came forward in 2004, I couldn't believe the doctors and nurses that pulled me aside to tell me their stories. There are so many people out there that have had experiences that, that are real to them. And, and that's why it's so important to get this out in the open for once and for all and to deal with it. And um, I've added chapters, in fact, the ebook. It has color pictures and live links because um, I, you know, I'm an educator and, and I know what it's like to 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 want more material. So I I put little links so people can explore. Also, the website Phoenix Lights Network website is packed with information um, on the home page, the the photo page, gap page, news page. We have a share page, and just recently, by the way, a Luke Air Force Base weather person that was on that night did contact me to say that she got many calls and actually went outside and <laughs> and uh and looked at it she saw it and uh mm -hmm. she confirmed as the alleged crewman did that luke was on it on lockdown that night so um there there is so much more to this story and we have the documentary who's won over a dozen uh international film festival awards we're so proud of that and they can get all this on on amazon uh dr edgar mitchell astronaut edgar mitchell 911 police operator came forward to say that even though the police said they got very few calls when she retired, she said they got hundreds and hundreds of calls. And we have a pilot, a commercial Vietnam pilot who saw one of these craft and looked into what he called a well of spinning energy. It's fascinating when you hear the witness reports. And also my latest is coming from the education background and, and my, um, uh, my passion for youth education of vital health issues. Uh, I am working on a curriculum and I also um, actually, uh, just to show real quick because it's a, it's a book for all ages, um, it's a graphic novel activities coloring book, uh, UFOs, uh, the Phoenix Lights and, uh, and Crop Circles, The Adventures of Sue F.O. and uh, Hugh F.O. <laughs> H-U-G-H, -H, Hugh F.O. He's a little alien and I work with wonderful people at Disney Illustrator and teachers and students uh, right in the classroom and it's 160 pages of Phoenix Light story plus um, the pros and cons I give all sides and we have the 10 different crafts to color 80 crop circles to color and I picked the most ornate as well as activities and we're talking word finders and crossword puzzles and so forth and the answers for those of us who are challenged for the answers and um, and it, it's just a, a fun book for teachers and parents and grandparents and kids alike so um, we have the trilogy now and certainly the website and I hope people take a peek and uh, if you've had the Phoenix Lights experience or something like it what I'm working on now is actually another book finally, after 25 years, to compile the data, how in real time and long term, the Phoenix Lights anomalies phenomena affected people. And I'm working with Paul Purry, who wrote the forward to my book. He's a near-death experience, best-selling author with Melvin Morris, MD, and Daniel Brinkley, and whatever. And we're really, really trying to get the data out there, how the Phoenix Lights, to answer your question, really affected people at such a deep, deep level. And it is so significant that we really, all of us need to take a look at what happened here in March 13th, 1997, as rest, as long, and the rest of the data as well. There is so much more to the story and really compile it in a scientific way that we show that the impact of the Phoenix Lights will be not only affecting us in real time, but for many, many more years to come and is probably a stepping stone to the next step of a critical mass being ready to accept who's ever out there and who's ever um, behind the Phoenix Lights. Well, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Lin. And, and uh, again, I will have all of your links below, uh, but uh, for the audio version, go ahead and give out your website one last time, which I assume is going to be the best way to reach out to you. Uh, what, give, give the audience that. People can contact me right on top or drlynn.phoenixlights.net. Um, at dot net, at, uh, dot net. Um, it's www.thephoenixlights.net is uh is the website address and it's the phoenix lights network just 
Google it. And we also have a Phoenix Lights Network uh, Facebook page where people, I, I welcome people to come there, share their stories. And, uh, and I have to say, it's very cathartic and healing as an experiencer. I know how that feels to be able to share the data. And I just hope people uh, will look at it and decide for themselves. Well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I know my audience loves it as well and probably learned quite a bit about the incident that we only really just kind of hear the, the the tip of the iceberg to in a lot of these shows and they deal with such an amazing amount of data and evidence in like 90 seconds sometimes when they go through it. And it's probably frustrating for you uh, to see that, you know, and have producers just kind of uh, misrepresent the event and, and not take care. So I'm glad to have been able to bring you on. There's obviously a lot more to cover. I, I do hope people check out your website, a lot of data there, your books and everything. Uh, and on a completely different side note, of uh, those listeners and watchers of this channel know my sonar dog, who is deaf and blind, and sometimes she likes to make an appearance. I don't know if you heard her, but she was coming through, and I kept my finger on the mute button as much as I could. <laughs> so I apologize if that did come through a little bit loud to you at times. I did try and mute her out, but God bless her. She just walks the halls, and when she's up, likes to make an appearance, and it always happens when I'm recording. So I apologize for that. But other than that, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your time and uh, sharing that with my audience. I absolutely so enjoy working with you, John, in, in the past and now as well, and, uh, and, and your audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me share. And I always end it with keep looking up. It's a double entendre. Now your audience knows why. Very good. Well, thank you. And thank you all for listening and watching. My name is John Greenwald Jr. And I'm signing off. I'll see you next time. <laughs>